Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Our God is good. You are welcome to our service uh, again this evening. We thank God for such a wonderful time this morning, and I tr trust that we will know His blessings as we continue here this evening. Let's bow our heads as we come before our great God in prayers. Almighty Father, we thank you because all things are of you. And we worship you because you have given us your son. You have reconciled us to yourself through your son and have given us that ministry of reconciliation. We rejoice in this, Lord. We know that it is all the work of your grace. And we pray that our hearts will respond to you tonight and you would find us here this evening and use this meeting as a means to draw us uh, closer to yourself and even the ones who are yet to believe to bring them to saving faith in you through your son we pray for these to the glory of your great name in jesus name amen, amen. amen. let's take up our hymn books and let's sing 459 459 master speak thy servant Hear it, waiting for thy gracious word, longing for thy voice that share it. Master, let it now be heard. I am listening, Lord, for thee. What hast thou to say to me? I believe we are here to hear from God. And uh, we'll stand to sing once the music begins. Master, speak, I servant, hear it. Speak thy servant here and waiting for thy precious word, longing for thy voice that cheereth, Master, let it now be heard. I am listening, Lord.
Um. Let us turn our Bibles to Nehemiah 8 for the public reading of God's Word. Nehemiah 8. The Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his words to our hearts. Amen. Amen. Now when, now all the people gather together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday before the men and women and those who could understand. And the heirs of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood <clears throat> which they had made for the pobles. And beside him at his right hand stood Metitiah, Shema, Ananiah, Orijah, Hilkiah, Masai, and at his left hand, Padiah, Meshael, Machiojah, Hashem, Pashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. For he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen. Amen. While lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Yeshua, Benaiah, Sheribiah, Jamin, Akkop, Shabitai, Hodija, Masai, Kelita, Azariah, Josabah, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites helped the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place. So they read distinctly from the book and the law of God, and they gave the sense. And help them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink, to send portions and rejoice greatly, because they understood the words that were declared to them. Now on the second day, the heads of the fathers' houses of all the people for the priests and Levites were gathered to Ezra the scribe in order to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel should dwell in booths during the fifth, during the feast of the seventh month, and that they should announce and proclaim it in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go out to the mountain and bring olive branches, branches of olive trees, myrtle branches, palm branches and branches of leafy trees to make booths as it is written. Then the people went out and brought them and made themselves booths, each one on the roof of his house and in their courtyards or the courts of the house of God and in the open square of the water gate and in the open square of the gate of Ephraim. So the whole assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and sat under the booths for since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, until that day, the children of Israel had not done so. And there was very great gladness. Also, day by day, 
from the first day until the last day, he read from the book of the law of God, and they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a sacred assembly, according to the prescribed manner. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads as we come before God in prayers. Father, we thank you that the entrance to your word give it light and gives understanding to the simple. We thank you because you have exalted your word above your names. And you have so many names. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but your word will still remain. Forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. We pray coming to you this evening, thanking you for the power of your word. As we sang, Master, speak thy servant, hear it. Let us hear your word clearly in our spirit. Let your word revive us. Let your word restore us. Let your word have its way in us. Lord, open the ears of our understanding. Give us believing hearts. We pray that your name will be glorified here this evening. Father, we remember our weaknesses. We remember our failures, our shortcomings. We know that all that you do is because of your grace and your covenantal agreement with your chosen, those who you love, whom you have called. Thank you that it is because of your grace and your mercy. And we rejoice in this. And we draw near to you on the basis of this. And we ask for your mercy afresh, Lord. Forgive us for our weaknesses, where we go astray, where we sin and fall short of your glory. We pray that we will be washed afresh the precious blood of your Son, that our minds will be renewed afresh by your Holy Spirit. You comfort our hearts, that you encourage us, that you edify, edify us, that you build us up on our most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. And so we turn this service over to you. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are not able to join us this evening. Let them know your presence with them, Lord. We pray that they would know that we're thinking of them and praying for them, Lord. We uh, come before you on the behalf of unsaved family members, Lord. We are praying for their salvation, that you uh, bring them here, Lord, to know that that gift that you have given, that unspeakable gift, that precious gift that you have given through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you will build your church with these people, husbands, wives, uh, 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 children, Lord, and grandchildren, Lord, siblings being saved, Lord, and added to the fold here. So we um, thank you for how you are working in our lives and our circumstances even in ways past finding out, Lord. And we acknowledge that you are sovereign. You are a good God. You are merciful. Your mercy endures forever. And we trust in you, knowing that your promises are yes and amen by Christ Jesus. And no good word that you have spoken concerning us will fall to the ground, will come back to you unfulfilled. But they shall all prosper in those things by which you sent them out for. So we hide under your presence tonight and we look to you even as we continue in this service, Lord, giving you all the glory, rejoicing in your salvation and blessing your holy name. Amen. 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 Let's take our song sheet and sing God of the Covenant, Triune Jehovah. We stand to sing once the music begins.
Chapter 9. Chapter 9 of Nehemiah. Thus reads the words of the living God. Now on the 24th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting in sackcloth and with dust on their heads. And those of Israelite lineage separated themselves from all foreigners. And they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God from one fourth of the day. And for another fourth they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. Then Joshua, Benaiah, Kadmiel, Shabaniah, Bunai, Sherebiah, Banai, and Shinanai stood on the stairs of the Levites and cried out with a loud voice to the Lord their God. And the Levites, Jeshua, Kadmiel, Benai, Hashabniah, Sherebiah, Hodijah, Shabaniah, and Pethahiah said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. You are the Lord God, who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans, and gave him the name Abraham. He found his heart faithful before you, and made a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hamorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, and the Gigashites, to give it to, their, to his descendants. You have performed your words, for you are righteous. You saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry by the Red Sea. You showed signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his servants, and against all the people of his land. For you knew that they acted proudly against them. So you, you made a name for yourself as it is this day. You divided the sea before them, so that they went through the midst of the sea on the dry land. And their per persecutors you threw into the deep, as a stone into the mighty waters. Moreover, he led them by day with a cloudy pillar, and by night with a pillar of fire, to give them light on the road which they should travel. He came down also on Mount Sinai, and spoke with them from heaven, and gave them just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments. He made known to them your holy Sabbath, and commanded them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses, your servant. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought them water out of the rock for their thirst, and told them to go in to possess the land which you had sworn to give them. But they and our fathers acted proudly, hardened their necks, and did not heed your commandments. They refused to obey, and they were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them, but they hardened their necks. And in their rebellion, they appointed a leader to return to their bondage, but you are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them. 
even when they made a molded calf for themselves and said, This is your God that brought you up out of Egypt. And what great provocations! Yet in your manifold mercies, you did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud did not depart from them by day to lead them on the road, nor the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way they should go. You also gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. Moreover, you gave them kingdoms and nations and divided them into districts. So they took possession of the land of Sion, the land of, king, of the king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, king of Bashan. You also multiplied your children as the stars of heaven and brought them into the land which you had told your fathers to go in and possess. So the people went in and possessed the land. You subdued before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gave them into their hands, their kings, and the people of the land, that they might do with them as they wished. And they took strong cities and a rich land, and possessed houses full of all goods, cisterns, already dug, vineyards, olive groves, and fruit trees in abundance. So they ate and were filled and grew fat, and delighted themselves in your great goodness. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you, cast your law behind their backs, and killed your prophets who testified against them to turn them to yourself. And they worked great provocations. Therefore you delivered them into the hand of their enemies who oppressed them. In the time of their trouble, when they cried to you, you heard from heaven. And according to your abundant mercies, you gave them deliverers who saved them from the hand of their enemies. But after they had rest, they again did evil before you. Therefore you left them in the hand of their enemies, so that they had dominion over them. Yet when they returned and cried out to you, you heard from heaven. And many times you delivered them according to your mercies, and testified against them, you might bring them back to your law. Yet they acted proudly, and did not heed your commandments, but sinned against your judgment which if a man does, he shall live by them. And they shrugged their shoulders, stiffened their necks, and would not hear. Yet for many years you had patience with them, and testified against them by your spirit and your prophets. Yet they would not listen. Therefore you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the land. Nevertheless, in your great mercy, you did not utterly consume them, nor forsake them. For you are God, gracious and merciful. Now therefore, our God, the great, the mighty, and awesome God, who keeps covenant and mercy, do not let all the trouble seem small before you that has come upon us, our kings and our princes, our priests and our prophets, our fathers and all your people, from the days of the kings of Assyria until this day. However, you are just in all that has befallen us, for you have dealt faithfully, but we have done wickedly. Neither our kings nor our princes, our priests nor our fathers have kept your law, nor heeded your commandments and your testimonies, with which you testified against them. For they have not served you in their kingdom, or in the many good things that you gave them, or in the large and rich land which you set before them. Nor did they turn from their wicked works. Here we are. Servants today, in the land that you gave to our fathers to eat its fruit and its bounty, here we are, servants in it, and the yields not increase to the kings you have set over us because of our sins. Also, they had dominion over our bodies and our cattle at their pleasure, and we are in great distress. Because of all these, we make a sure covenant and write it. Our leaders, our Levites, and our priests, seal it. Amen. Amen. Father, we come to you once again and ask that 
you break the bread of your word to us. Thank you that you have opened the ears of our understanding and the eyes of our hearts to hear, to see, and to receive your word, which has come to us, Lord. We pray that you help the message that you have for us uh, to minister to us that you will be glorified. Have your way by your spirit amongst us, even now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 By the grace of God, I have titled this message, Marks of Revival. Marks of Revival. When you come to the subject of revival, what immediately flies through your head is what you can do for this to happen. When you speak about revival, you are talking about making alive again. It is to bring back to life again. It means life was there before and it was lost. Something came in and snuffed the life out. Biblical revival is when God begins to quicken. I say God because he is the author of life. And revival is when he begins to restore you to himself, thereby giving you life. The Bible describes this in Ephesians 2, 4-5, when it mentions, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive. He quickened us together in Christ. By grace, you have been saved. What do we learn here? Revival is for God's people. Those whom he has chosen and calls. Everyone that God revives is as a result of him setting his covenantal love upon them. There is nothing that you can do to earn this love. Hence, revival is a free gift of God. You cannot work it up. You cannot earn it. You cannot produce it. It is not something that you can bring about by yourself, but it is something that is in God's jurisdiction. One thing that is actually very crucial in revival and uh, what it, it is linked to is the doctrine of God's sovereignty. He rules and overrules and can do as he wishes. He can do what he wants whenever he wants. Our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Psalm 115 verse 3. The ball of revival is not in your court. I know in our zeal we say it is because we long for revival. But the blunt truth is that there is nothing we can do to make revival happen. It is exclusively a sovereign move of God. And in this passage, there are clear marks or signs of a revival given by God. That is, indicators that God is restoring his people and reviving them again. In other words, uh, they are pointers or signposts uh, signifying that God is walking in revival power. How do we know that God is restoring us to himself and imparting life to us again? Again, if we I think there is something uh, we need to do for this to happen. Uh, we find the words, pardon, gracious, merciful, uh, kindness, mercies, and mercy, totaling 11 times in this passage. And these words imply God's free gift, which we do not warrant, deserve, or earn. So where a God-sent revival is taking place, God's free gift is being evidenced, which is the first mark and basis for revival. God's mercy. God's mercy. God is the main actor in revival. He is the one who restored uh, the captivity 
of his people after so many years and settled them in the cities of the land which he gave to their fathers. He is the one who first moved towards them, drawing them to himself in spite of their wickedness towards him. We are uh, hell deserving sinners in all uh, honesty, not just because of our uh, sins, but because of how worthy God is. He is infinitely holy. When you think uh, that uh, some good is in you that uh, makes you deserving of God's uh, blessing, it's because you have a false and adulterated view of God. You do not know him adequately. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Proverbs 9.10 Come, ye children, David writes, listen to me and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. So the fear of the Lord is not uh, the court. It is taught. And you learn it by studying about God in scriptures. It is the antidote for destruction. It is the remedy for the fear of man. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. The fear of the Lord tendereth to life. It prolongs days. It keeps you from the path of wicked men and immoral women. And it keeps immoral men and wicked women from your path. You find these sayings in the Bible, especially in the book of Proverbs. This fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom, is the principal thing. And in getting, in getting it, also get understanding. Wisdom is profitable to direct you in the path of righteousness, which ultimately is Christ. Christ is the embodiment of God's wisdom and righteousness. God has made him for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, it is written, He who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Like Isaiah, when we come to realize the infinitely holy God, we see that there is a massive problem. We are deserving of nothing but hell. We are not only sinners by nature, we are sinners by actions. We are sinners spiritually and morally. The seraphim, uh, before his presence, the burning ones, that's what uh, they are called. They have passed through fire, as it were, and uh, they are pure. They are called burning ones. They have been purified uh, by fire. And yet, these uh, pure creatures, they veil their faces and cover uh, themselves before this holy God. They are creatures, the works of of his hands, he, the one who is uncreated, the eternal God. Uh, Isaiah speaks about how uh, the workman, he molds an image. Uh, the goldsmith, he overspreads it with gold. And the, gold, uh, the silversmith, he casts silver chains on it. And whoever is poor for such a contribution chooses a tree that will not rot and seeks for a skilled workman to prepare a carved image for him. But God, he is not the imagination of man's mind or works of his hands. It is man who is God's own idea and the works of his hands. Man was created in the image of God to give glory to God. But he <coughs> takes the sides of Satan, God's enemy, and he suppresses the truth in righteousness. And there we find in Nehemiah 9, verse 16. But they and our fathers acted proudly, hardened their necks, and did not heed your commandments. They refused to obey, and they were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them. But they hardened their necks, and in their rebellion, they appointed a leader to return to their bondage 
but you are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them. The mercies of God run deeper than our sins. It is because of his mercies we are not destroyed. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive. He quickened us together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. What refreshing words we hear in scripture about this God. This is one of the marks that God is reviving us when he moves towards us in mercy as we read there and he doesn't give us the judgment that we deserve but instead gives us the favor we do not deserve. The second mark of revival is God's word. God's word such the scriptures and find out wherever God brought about a revival and you find his word visiting the situation it was like that in Genesis 1 the earth was dark and empty without form it was a mass of mess and God began to speak and created the order the ordered world we see today out of that chaotic situation by speaking his words it was like that in the valley of dry bones there were many bones scripture says and they were very dry it was a hopeless a situation but the word of the lord came on the scene and through his prophet and revival began to take place you cannot bring about a revival any more than the dry bones can bring themselves back to life again it was god and we witness eventually the word became flesh in him was life and the life became the light of man darkness is a type of death but when the word of god the father shows up he imparts life to us dispelling our darkness and defeating our death we see a picture of this as well at lazarus grave a man is dead because of sin he is not only dead he is dead many days and he stinks but at the voice of the son of god lazarus come forth man comes back to life again and comes out of the grave weakness in this passage the primary and chief position of god's word in a revival let's go back to chapter 8 and read from verse 1 again now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square and was in front of the water gate and they told ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of moses which the lord had commanded israel so ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding the first day of the seventh month then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday before the men and women and those who could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law when the book of the law the bible the bread of god as it were is being broken you witness what is happening with these people you see the reverence uh, for god you know you notice how they begin to respond to god in worship you see there that uh, they, they, they they stand up before the lord they show their reverence nobody tells them to do that god set them free as it were and they begin to worship him It says in verse 9, verse 8 and 9, So they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. 
Do not mourn nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the Lord. This is conviction of sin. Jesus said when the Holy Spirit comes, he shall convict the world of sin, righteousness and judgment. How does the Holy Spirit bring this about? It is with the word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit at, as it is uh, read, as it is explained, at, as it is proclaimed. The Holy Spirit works with the world. A clear mark of when God is reviving his people is the centrality of scriptures. Scriptures comes to bear on the scene. Scripture takes the center stage again in churches, homes, schools, families, workplaces, and in the nation as a whole. And if we look at the situation in this our day, it's like, it is fastly eroding from our society. Scriptures is being taken out, even in churches. You find little time given to the reading of scriptures. Some churches they don't even have the public reading of scriptures. And people just turn only to the New Testament, as we heard this morning. But when God is moving in a revival, scripture comes back. In, into that center place. It is not taken out. It is not given less time. It is not neglected. It is not hurried through as if boring. What is our attitude towards God's word? Do we roll our eyes when it's, be, it's being read and can't wait until it finishes and then we sigh once it's done? Or do we have a heart that yearns for God's word. We think about some names in scripture that we even struggle to pronounce. We just want to go over them quickly or avoid them. We talk about the Old Testament. Those outdated words that no longer apply to us. This book here from Genesis to Revelation is the word of of God and it tells us about God and it is still relevant today. Is it a burden to you to read God's word or you delight yourself in his law? Do you question and critique God's word or you allow it to convict you as we see here? The word of God is being read. People began to weep because of their sins. In response to the word of God, as the Spirit is convicting them by what they are hearing. Do we mourn and weep as the Spirit is working with the word in our hearts, like the people of Israel here? Or do we shrug it off like it's not speaking uh, to us, but to someone else out there? Is God reviving us? Look at verse 3, what it says there. It says they read it from morning until midday. Look at verse 3 of chapter 9. It says, And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for one fourth of the day. And for another fourth they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. The one fourth of the day. That is for three hours, which began during the offering of the morning sacrifice. And for the first three hours, that's 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., they listened to the word of God being read. And the next three hours till the evening sacrifice, that's from 12 to 3 p.m., they confessed their sins and worshipped the Lord. Interestingly, Christ was offered on the cross at, at 9, the offering of the morning sacrifice, and by the at 3 p.m., the offering of the evening sacrifice, he died. It's interesting. The whole day, which was a day of fasting and humiliation, was used in seeking God in his word, uh, praying and worshiping. It's in mercy that God brings his word of truth to us. Proverbs 16, 6 mentions that in mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity. They go together. The mercy of God 
and his word, which is truth. This was the same uh, we, we read about in John 1.14, where it says, grace and truth. It says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Christ was full of grace, and he was full of truth. The word of God is the truth. And it's a schoolmaster that brings us to the grace that Christ freely gives. Some people think that the sermon or the singing or the praying is the best part of the service. No, it's not. The best and most important part of the service is the reading and the hearing of the word of God. We have not esteem the word of God like we really should when last did we go to church to hear scriptures publicly being read was that what we were looking forward to why did we go is it to hear a good sermon or to enjoy a good worship experience or fellowship these things are good but what is greater is to come to God's house seeking to hear him speak and God speaks to us in the reading and hearing of his word in revival God stirs your heart and restores your hunger and desire for his word once again thirdly another mark of God moving in revival is God ordained prayers God ordained prayers notice what these God ordained prayers are as the work of God is going on in the hearts of his people. They return to God and uh, their prayer first centers on him. The prayers begins with him. The people are exhorted in, in verse 5 of chapter 9 to stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Blessed be your glorious name which is exalted above all blessing. And praise. God's name is blessed, hallowed, and praised. That's what we read there. They declare the Lord's sovereignty over all. You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth, and everything on it, the seas, and all that is in them. And you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. This prayer is steeped in scriptures. You could tell that. The scriptures drive this prayer. They knew God through the knowledge of his word. And this informed their prayers. You find uh, uh, those words, they echo Psalm 148 verse 2 to 4. God ordained prayers are the prayers God wants to hear. They are the prayers that center on him and his redemptive purposes in the history of his people. God loves to hear these things. You find there from verse 7, You are the Lord God who chose Abraham and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you. What happened? God came to Abraham and Abraham believed the promises of God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He believed God's word and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. That's how God found his heart faithful because the word of God came to him and impacting faith to him, causing him to believe. And then he'd been accounted to him as righteous. And it says, and made a covenant with him. Abraham didn't find God. It wasn't Abraham going into covenant with God. God found him and God made a covenant with him because he's faithful. It says to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Pesicites, and the Jebusites, and the Gigashites, to give it to his descendants. You have performed your words. For you are righteous. <laughs> you witness the Lord's salvation. On behalf of his people. He continues. You saw the affliction uh, of our fathers in Egypt. And heard their cry. By the rest. You show signs and wonders. God uh, delivered them. Verse 11. And he divided the sea before them. So that they went through the midst of the sea. On dry ground. You see his protection. Verse 12. Moreover you led them by day with a cloudy pillar. And by night with a pillar of fire. 
to give them light on the road which they should travel. His guidance. And he grants them spiritual blessings as well. Going down to verse 13 on Mount Sinai. He gave them uh, his just ordinances and true laws. Good statutes and, and commandments. And he gave them his Sabbath, his holy Sabbath. And commanded them precepts, statutes and laws. And we see his physical provision as well. Verse 15. He gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought them water out of the rock for their thirst. He is magnified and glorified as his past mercies are reviewed in prayers. Observe as well that they are confessing their sins. Verse 16. In prayers, they remember the sins of their fathers and, and they begin to make this confession. And that's what we find in those who know God. They know themselves. It is them who are needy. It is them who are in the wrong and have offended God. It is them who have sinned against God and standing in the need of his forgiveness and cleansing. Remember the publican who came into the temple and he cried, God be merciful to me, a sinner. He was, he was not playing the blame game uh, with, with God. He wasn't seeing himself as righteous and others uh, sinners, all our righteousness is as filthy rags. The Bible says we have no righteousness of our own. It is us standing in the need of forgiveness, standing in the need of prayer. Naked we come to him for dress. Naked we turn to him uh, for grace. So you find the confession of the sins and uh, of their fathers. Uh, it says there from verse 17 how they refused to obey and they were not mindful of your wonders and you did that you did among them but they hardened their necks and in their rebellion they appointed a leader to return to their bondage but you are God ready to pardon gracious and merciful slow to anger abundant in kindness and did not forsake them this is the faithfulness of God and this is the basis by which uh, the people pray to God. He, his faithfulness, his mercy. This is their plea in prayers. And in spite of their sinfulness, God is pardoned. He is gracious. He is merciful. He is slow to anger and abundant in kindness. And then we find the conclusion of their confession, which is still based on God's mercy in verse 31. Nevertheless, in your great mercy, you did not utterly consume them, nor forsake them. For you are God, gracious and merciful. This is our only plea, God's mercy. And then we move into supplication. They go into supplication, which is still based on God's covenant and mercy. That's what it says in verse 32. <laughs> It says, now therefore our God, the great, the mighty, the awesome God, who keeps covenant and mercy, do not let all the trouble seem small before you, that has come upon us, our kings and our princes, our priests and our prophets, our fathers and all your people, from the days of the kings of Assyria until this day. And they are acknowledging all this before God, that he is just, and all that has come Upon them is, is, it is justly deserved. It says, for you have dealt faithfully, but we have dealt wickedly. That's verse 33. Their supplication, special request, involves intercessions. As we see in verse 34, they begin to identify themselves with the sins of their kings and princes and priests and fathers. They say that we have not kept your law. It is clear that they have the sovereignty of God in mind as well as his covenant as they bring their prayers to a close. Remember the words of God to Ezekiel. Say, son of man, can these bones live? Ezekiel knows that God is a covenant-keeping God, that God is faithful even when his people are unfaithful. 
Ezekiel also know that God is sovereign and he doesn't presume upon God's mercy because God can choose to do as he wishes. He is the Almighty. So God asks Ezekiel a question that only he can answer and Ezekiel responds correctly. Only thou knowest, sovereign Lord, sovereign Lord, only you know. There is the sovereignty of God in his covenantal dealings with his people. The last point in this passage which evidences God's moving among his people in revival is his covenantal agreement. His covenantal agreement. The people have returned from captivity and have settled in Jerusalem. The walls have been rebuilt and yet things are in the way they used to be. They are still under the rulership of enemy Nation. That's what he said then, verse 36. Here we are, servants today, and the land that you gave to our fathers to eat its fruit and its bounty. Here we are, servants in it. That's what sin does. He places one in captivity, in bondage. It takes away the glory of God and causes you to inherit shame and pain. You could sense a feeling of regret as they conclude that glory. And, and, and blessing and prosperity they once knew is no more. They are now da- down and dry. Darkness, death, decay have settled in. Here we are, servants in this land. And it yields much increase to the kings you have set over us because of our sins. Also, they have dominion over our bodies and our cattle and, and at their pleasure and we are in great distress. They recall their pain, their suffering, their losses, their spiritual decay, adversity, darkness, bondage. And they see all this in view of God's covenant and mercy with them. And now they are going into agreement, the last verse, with him. And we make a covenant, a sure covenant and write it. They cannot make any sure covenant. That's just the truth. God is the one who made a sure covenant with them. To understand what they are saying there, you have to consider the context. You go back to verse 31, read from verse 31. Nevertheless, in your great mercy, you did not utterly consume them nor forsake them. For you are God, gracious and merciful. This is what they had knowledge of. And they recited this already in prayers. And see what it says in verse 32. Now therefore our God, the great, the mighty, the awesome God, who keeps covenant and mercy. Who keeps covenant and mercy. This explains what is being said here in verse 38 as they conclude their prayers and the basis for this is simply God's sure covenant that he made with them. They are basically agreeing with God's covenant with them. They are saying Amen to it. That's what it means when you look at the word sure. They are saying Amen to what has already been established with them. God has now brought them to a place where they are going into agreement. They are, they are, they are saying amen to the, to the promises of God and his covenantal agreement uh, with them. They are making a commitment uh, to God. You cannot make this commitment with God except he first makes this commitment which you why have you chosen to believe in him to worship and serve him even to the detriment of your life and family some have been ostracized and they have been uh, disowned from their families and they have been cast out because of their belief in the Lord Jesus many have died because of their faith why would you deny yourself would you pick up your cross daily and follow him why would all of this be your reality Except that he first committed himself to you through his son, 
Jesus Christ. It is because he has given you the deposit of his spirit. It is because you are now a habitation of God by his spirit. It is because you are in a covenantal agreement with him which is ratified in blood. That is why you can say amen to his oath, his covenant and agreement with you. That is what God does. Oh, may the Lord open our eyes to see and discern these marks of his revival amongst his people, even in this passage in Nehemiah, because there is a clear picture there of God working in revival among his people, in turning their hearts uh, back uh, to him. Does it mean that we do nothing? That's not what it means. There is no passivity during a revival, but rather activity as we see here and everywhere in scripture and in world history where God was reviving his people. What it simply means is that what we witness being done are actually marks of the workings of God through us. When God is moving and stirring us and reviving us and bringing us back to himself, you begin to see all these activities, but it is not what we are trying to walk up. It is what God is doing. We are loving his word. We are loving his house. We are loving his people. We are, uh, we, are, we are just running after God. We are seeking him in our private devotion. There is a divine uh, pattern that is observed. It sees an act of God's mercy. God's word takes center stage god ordained prayers our weakness god begins to stir our hearts to call upon him to turn to him and we begin to uh, be broken before god and confess our sins as we witness here and uh, god's people agree with uh, with his covenantal blessing they say amen to all the promises of god because god is faithful and he keeps a mercy with his people. Amen. 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 Let's take our hymn books and turn to 631 and sing Tell Out My Soul. Six three one.
Father, we thank you for this time, Lord. We thank you. Oh, we have read the book of Nehemiah and what we have seen, Lord. And we acknowledge that you are God. Thank you for your sovereignty, for how you're working. In the midst of your people, you are restoring us, reviving us, bringing us back to yourself, building us up in our most holy faith, uh, 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 causing your words to come back again and take center stage in our lives, Lord, and in all that uh, concerns us. Lord, we thank you because this is uh, an act of your mercy, Lord, in your own uh, goodness, O oh Lord, and your kindness, and your causing uh, these things to happen, Lord. We are delighting. Uh, to come to your house we are delighting to have fellowship with one another we are loving one another we are learning to live sacrificially lord and we are giving ourselves uh, to prayer lord we thank you we can't take credit for these things lord and you know us lord you know how we fall short and really if it was up to us lord we will not be doing these things lord but it's because of your spirit working in, in line with your mercy lord because you are gracious so we just um, commit our lives into your hands as we go through this week. Let your presence uh, uh, be with us. Let your joy be our strength. Help those uh, struggling with health issues. Remember, baby, once again, even as we pray this morning, we pray for the ministration of your power, Lord, that you restore the health of that child, Lord. We pray that you help him because your grace is enough, Lord. Show your power. Do good to him, Lord. Grant peace and rest to the family members, Lord. Let them see your salvation, Lord. So, Lord, we go into this week under your care, under your eyes upon us, Lord, knowing that you who watches over Israel does not slumber, neither do you sleep, Lord. So, Lord, bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord, lift the light of his countenance upon you. And grant you his perfect shalom, his perfect peace. Amen. 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 Amen.